Hey, what's up? Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night worship service where we are coming to you from the worship center, um, our faith life session, where we bring you the, the most important message you can hear as it relates to experiencing the manifestation of the promises of God. All the promises in God are yea and amen. No doubt about that. Like everything God has for you, he still desires for you. Nothing can deter that from happening. You might be able, you might delay it a little bit with disobedience. You might delay it a little bit with missing on the mark. You might delay it a little bit with not doing what you're supposed to do. Sit back waiting on God to do something. But it's still for you. No matter how, if you're supposed to have it when you was 20, you can still get it when you're 40. It's still for you. The only thing that will prevent you from possessing the land that God has for you is unbelief. That's it. And the things associated with unbelief. What's associated with unbelief? With not believing is not taking action. What's associated with not believing is not doing what you've been told to do. Right? That's the thing that's associated with not believing is not doing. I can also say this. The other thing that's associated with not doing, of not believing, is not speaking. So when you, when you don't believe, when you don't believe, you don't speak. Why do I say that? Because we speak what we believe according to the scripture. I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. The spirit of faith. If you don't believe, unbelief is associated with not speaking. Not speaking is associated with not doing. Not doing is associated with not having. So that's the problem with not believing. That's the one thing that can prevent you from possessing what God has for you. It's unbelief. Well, how do I deal with unbelief? How do I get to the place where, I, where, where I'm at a place where, where faith has come so strong that I believe? Now, we know believing, believing, believing is a soulish issue. Faith is a spiritual issue. We broke that down for you two, two sessions ago. Faith is God's word in my spirit. Believing is when I think from, what's the, when I think from the word that's in my spirit, when I think from the, from the position of truth. Truth, faith is truth in the spirit. David said, God desires truth in my inner parts, in my inner, in my inner man, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. I know wisdom from the spirit man, through the soul, into my life. Well, what blocks the word that's in my spirit is, is me not thinking from that word. See, when the word of God comes to my spirit that I am healed, I'm now supposed to think from that perspective. When you look up that word believe, it means to think from truth or to think on truth or to think from the position of truth. That's a, that's a word that affects the mind, the soul. Well, when I think from that word, I don't think nothing less than what the word of God has been, the word that's in my spirit. I don't think nothing less than, that's where the whole idea of casting down imaginations and how things, whenever there's a word or thought that comes against what's been spoken to my spirit and what I believe, I got to cast it down. But if I don't think from that truth, I stifle. I don't eliminate, I stifle the manifestation. And that's what it's really about. Faith is the mechanism by which God reveals to us what is in the spirit so that we now become responsible for, for, for doing what we were instructed to do. You ain't got to come up with your own instructions. You ain't got to come up with your own plan. You ain't got to lean to your own understanding. Doing what you've been instructed to do, doing what you've been led by the spirit of God to do, this Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you into all truth so that I can now experience or manifest what it is God wants me to manifest so that I can now live in that experience of the manifestation. But unbelief will kill it. That's the only thing. Nothing you did wrong, nothing you said wrong, no, no place you went wrong, nothing you, oh, nothing. That, that's the only thing that can kill it. Well, you're going to hear it. Listen, you're going to need to hear. You need to hear. You need to hear what it is that's going to bring you from wherever you are to that place. And the worship center and our faith, life, sessions bring that to you. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. No other word that's as important as you hearing the word of faith. Right? Tonight we're going to dive back into something that's of utmost importance, and that is how God supplies our need. Before we get into that, though, I want to give you an opportunity to partner with us. If you're watching it via Facebook, if you're watching it via YouTube, if you're watching it via Zoom, look, partnership. Like, that's what this series is about, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm frank about it, and not Damaris. Like, this is what it's about. God supplying your need is about partnership. Partnership with him via the resources he's using to bring life to your life. 
i.e., Demaris Johnson Ministries, I, the Faith Life Sessions, the Worship Center. Like, like God, God, he listen, speak to you directly. But he also use resources, ministries, ministers he's raised up, he's established in the body of Christ via by revelation. Right? Because true authority can only is only associated with revelation. You don't find no authoritative figures in the Word of God that didn't have a revelation of God that was that was unique and different than the po folks around them, than his peers. Right? So when God puts a resource in your life, God expects you to partner with that resource so that y'all can grow together. Just like your life, God wants to grow your life. He wants to grow that particular ministry, that resource life, and y'all want y'all supposed to grow together. Well, we give you the opportunity to grow with us because we want, we want to expand this revelation, this understanding that God has given us beyond where we are right now, beyond the scope of what we have right now. But unless you partner with us through your prayers, through your, through your um, pay out of your tithe and offering, and through your, your, your showing up to hear what we got to say. Because to me, that's what's most important. You need to hear what we're saying so that you can experience what we're saying, so that you can live what we're saying, so people can see your life and say, hey, how do you do that? And you say, I got this brother I listen to. You need to start listening to him, right? That's all it is. So we need you to share, like, comment, all those things. Commit to giving monthly or bring your tithe and offering. And God going to, like, grow us together. Like, we'll, we'll see us grow together, right? The blessings on your life, the blessings on my life. Let's bring those blessings together and watch what happens, right? I want to thank you in advance. Lord, we thank you for the giving of your people to the work. May the word of God that they hear today be manifested in their life and in their heart in a, in a mighty, mighty way. Confirm this word by signs and wonders in their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody watching this for the first time going to see something happen miraculously in their life. Just because you tuned in, you decided to partner with us, watch something miraculous happen. God going to confirm the word that, that you're receiving. He going to confirm his word. The one thing God will do, he'll confirm his word. He'll let you know what you just heard is right. And I'm going to manifest something so, you can, so that you can experience this, so that you can know it's right, and you can keep on listening. All right, I'm ready to write. Look. Man, I've been trying to get to Philippians. I, I almost feel like Paul in a sense. This, this lesson number four, there's four chapters in Philippians. I've been working my way to 419 because remember, we, we revealed to y'all that that's the, Philippians 419 was the original thought that God, that Paul, that God gave Paul or that Paul had as it relates to the church at Philippi. Like that was the original thought because there were people that was in deep poverty and God was like, and Paul was thinking about God supplying the need. But he didn't start there in, 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 in with the Philippians. He didn't put that in chapter 1. He put that in 419. Like 419 is like the crescendo of, of the letter, of the revelation that Paul wanted to give to the, to the church of Philippi. Like, like that's why he said, he, goes, he, he said, finally. He said, finally. Like, man, I've been waiting to get to this. I've been waiting to get to this fourth chapter. I've been waiting to get here for the longest. Like I had to take you from 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3 to chapter 4. Finally. Brethren, finally, right? He got to that place where he was ready to just say, man, here we go, right? So, but I need you to, I need you to, I need you to build with me. I need you to enter with me into the spirit, into the thought of Philippians so that 419 is validated in your life. Because too often people have been telling us to, you know, apply that to our life. Well, that's not the design that God has for the word of God. That's not the design God had for the word of God, for you to be applying the word to your life. I know that's something we say, and I get it. I get it. I get it. Right? But but the the the, the idea, the idea of applying the word brings me under the letter of the law. Well, we know what the letter do. The letter kill it. The letter separates. Then it cessates. Then it brings misery and frustration. But what we got to do first is we got we got to live. We got to listen. We got to receive what makes the engrafted word. Then we live from that word we received. As I journey through life, I got a word. Like I'm fully equipped. Like 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 I'm full, like like Jesus. Like let's take Jesus. Right. Most folk would have you to believe that Jesus knew everything that was going to happen the day the day that it happened. No, I don't believe that was the case at all. Same way the Bible says like this. Jesus said like this. He said like this. He said, look, he said, I always do those things that please my father. What does it take to please the father? Somebody say faith. Yep, faith. It takes faith. So we know Jesus lived by faith. Like living by faith don't mean I don't know nothing, but it also doesn't mean I know everything that's going to happen. I'm going to say that again. When you live by faith, some people think living by faith means I don't know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and just God is just going to do it. No, no, that's not it either. 
Some folks think living by faith means you're going to know everything that's going to happen. No, nope, it don't mean that either. Sometimes you might not know when things happen. Sometimes you will know. You will know what's going to happen. Sometimes it's somewhere in between where you got, you got an unction, you got a knowing, you got an idea, you got a feeling, you got a discernment. But you don't quite understand it with the, with, the, with the natural understanding, with the soulless understanding, but you just, you've been led by the Spirit of God. And as, and as you are following the Spirit of God, whenever, whenever a demand is placed on you to, to manifest something, it happens. It's almost like Jesus, shouldn't even say almost, it's like Jesus being led into the wilderness, the Bible says, to pray. But on his way to pray, he was tempted of the devil. He was fully prepared to handle the, the temptation of the devil before he went to the garden. As he was led by the Spirit of God. When he got there, because he had so much word on the inside of him, he had so much life on the inside of him, he had so much truth in his spirit, whatever was demanded of him, whatever was pressure was placed upon him in that moment, he was able to withstand. He was able to draw from the inside. When he was when he wanted to go to the other side from wherever he was at, and the storm rose up. Peace. There was a demand for peace made upon him by his disciples. He was able to draw from the peace from within to, to, to deal with the peace from without. Same way we live, same way, same way. He lived, Jesus lived from that place of peace. Therefore, when peace was demanded of him in the midst of chaos, he was able to issue it forth. He didn't have to apply peace to the situation. He just said, peace be still. He lived from peace. When you live from peace, when you live from patience, when you live, I'm going to sum it up, when you live from love, everything you need as life happens you are equipped to fulfill the demand or the need in that moment. That's how it works. So, so when we're talking about, we're talking about building into Philippians 4.19 to the point to where we realize that this is not something that I need to apply to my business or apply to my marriage or to apply to this situation or to apply to my finances or to apply to my life or to apply to this situation. No. We're going to deal with that once you find out how God supplies your need in the first place. But this is, this is a leading into Paul was taking them through. So we've been taking you through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. We've taken you through these different chapters and we've highlighted some of the things that Paul mentioned that, that, that spoke of the connection and the intimacy that Paul had with the church of Philippi. Because without, without that level of intimacy, that level of partnership, that level of connection, you, 419, you, you, you don't even, you don't even, you don't even, you're not in a position to activate that particular scripture, okay? Um, but Paul, Paul, we, we highlighted those things. You got to go to the, the, the lessons one, two, three to see how, what, we, how, what we highlighted from those chapters and how important it is. And I, and I encourage you to do it. Don't just skip to, to, to this chapter, to this lesson, because you, if you don't get lesson one, two, three, the crescendo won't be the same, right? And 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 we left off. We left off on um, on Sunday uh, in Philippians chapter four, right? And and we started off by telling you that that you have to have a level of intimacy um, with Father, with Father, if you're going to with Holy Spirit, if you're going to um, really experience the fullness of the salvation that is great toward us. The whole purpose for God sending Jesus was so that he could be reconnected to his sons. Everything for God is about family. And it's about the celebration of family. It's about the manifestation of family. It's about the, the loving of family. It's about the communion and the fellowship that takes place between a son and a father, or a father and a son, or a father and a daughter. It's everything that takes place. The ultimate, the ultimate experience that God wants us to have is that of sonship, the spirit of sonship. Whereby we've been given the spirit of sonship. The spirit of his son, well, well, what about we cry, Abba, that cries for a level of intimacy and experiencing God in a manner that, 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 that allows for us to enter into everything God has for us. If there's anything that we need to focus on is your intimacy and fellowship with Father God. Just say good morning to him sometime. Just say good morning. I say good morning to him every morning. I wake up by the first thing I say, good morning, Holy Spirit. <sighs> I feel my spirit man come alive. Ah, oh, I'm telling you. Okay, look. All right, so so we, we have that. Now, I, I want to move, Paul, I want to get through these next these several verses so that I can get to Philippians 4.19. Then we're going to go, word, we're going to break that thing down so it's clear to you how God supplies your need. And I'm pretty certain it's not how most folks think he supplies your need, right? Um, we left off on verse number three where Paul said, uh, he listed he listed some people and he said whose names were written who are who are in the in the book of life and we're talking about that. I want to start now from 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, 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 let me, let me talk about this concept of rejoicing in the Lord, right? What it's talking about here is the Lord is your source of joy, right? The Lord got to be your source of joy. If your source of joy are in things, you're going to be disappointed. If your source of joy is in other people, you're going to be disappointed. If your source of joy is in food, is in cars, is in material things, you're going to be disappointed. I'll never forget, um, this was prior to my salvation. I was playing professional football, and it was Christmas. And so during that time, uh, the team that I was playing for with made the playoffs, and so there's a bonus check given when you make the playoffs. So we got a bonus check. Well, this was around Christmas time, so I took the bonus check. I said, you know, I'm going I'm to spend Christmas on me. Right? I'm going to treat myself to a nice Christmas. Went out spending an ungodly amount of money on myself. Came home, everything from clothes to, to um, 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 appliances to, you know, technical gadgets to, like, you know, just shoes. Had, like, everything that, that I spent my money on at the time, right? Came home. I took everything out, laid it across the bed, laid it all around the house, looking at, just looking at how I treated me to me, right? And I'll never forget... I thought being able to do something like that for myself would, would bring me a level of joy and satisfaction and contentment on the inside. But as I stood around looking at everything, I looked around and I was expecting for this like, man, yeah, D, like, man. But, in, but, but actually, the opposite had happened. There was this, uh, all, this, this like this emptiness I felt. It was felt like I felt hollow on the inside. As I looked to these things to give me some sense, some sense of joy and credibility and, and substantiate who I was and, and what I was able to accomplish at that time. But I, there, was a, there, was, I could, there was a void, there was an emptiness on the inside that eventually turned into this pain, this sorrow, this grief. And I said, what am I doing? What is, I said, is, I said, is this it? I, I, like I was talking to myself. I didn't know God at the time. I said, is this it? Is this? And you got to understand, when it came to football, since I was eight years old, like, that's, I, like, that was everything to my life. Like, everything centered around football. Like, everything about my life centered around football since the time I was eight years old. Everything was around, everything was secondary to football. I'm like, is this, is this what I sacrificed everything for? I was empty on the inside. See, I didn't know God was dealing with me at the time. I didn't even realize it. I know I had somebody praying for me. I know exactly who was praying for me as well at the time now. But I'm like, man, is this it? I was empty. See, if you're looking for anything outside of God to bring you joy, you're going to be disappointed. That's what Paul was saying. When he was like, he said, be joyful. Let we say it like that. Get your joy from the Lord always. Again, I say always have the Lord be your source of joy. When you, live, when you live from that source of joy, now small things don't matter to you anymore. The little things don't take away that. Little things can't cause you to get disappointed, frustrated, anxious, nervous, fearful. We're going to find out. why. See, Paul is setting them up. He's, he said, let the Lord be your source of joy. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Now watch this. Ah, watch this. Look, look how this connects. Look. First, he tells them to let the Lord be your source of joy because he understands when the Lord is your source of joy, nothing will cause you that word moderation. Guess what word moderation means? Anti-panic, antidepressant. Joy is an antidepressant. Joy is an anti-panic mechanism. The joy of the Lord. When you live from the space of joy, when you live from that joy of the Lord, it's an antidepressant. And you're, how are you going to be depressed when the joy of the Lord is your strength? How are you going to be depressed when you live from the source of joy? How are you going to be depressed? How are you going to be, how are you going to live in panic and fear? And then, how are you going to live from that when, when the joy of the Lord is your strength? When the Lord is the strength in my life, it's it, from the joy of the Lord that we're able to do mighty exploits. Like, how? You're not. I encourage you to listen. Let the Lord be your source of joy. Wait, I think I hear somebody asking. I think I hear, I think I hear somebody asking the right question. How do you make the Lord your source of joy? That's, that's a wonderful question. That's the million dollar question. 
How do you make the Lord your source of joy? Let me answer for you like this. You don't. It comes with the package. Oh. See, that's the secret. Everything is built in. Everything is built in. Guess what everything is built in? Love. Love. Galatians 2. When it speaks about the, 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 the expression of the fruit of love, joy is one of the expressions. <sighs> There's no greater joy that we should have as sons of God than the presence of our Lord. Because in his presence, joy is complete. The fullness of it. Well, what happened? Romans 5, 5 tells you what happened. What's the first thing the Holy Spirit did when he came to you? The Bible says he shed abroad the love of God in your You had a love immersion experience. You was immersed in love. When you immersed in love, guess what you immersed in? You immersed in the presence of God because God is love. Where his presence is, there is love. So what do you have to do in order for you to make God your, your, your source of joy? Immerse yourself in your love experience. Just, just immerse yourself in love. I said, I know you're trying to be joyful. Listen, man, you got you to live from love. You got to be in love. I like my boy Ralph Trapp. I'm lost in love. I can't live without him. I can't live without him. Don't want to live without him. Don't plan on living without him. Don't plan on going no further without him. I'm lost in love. I'm completely yielded to the length, to the breadth, to the depth, to the height of love. That's how you make him your joy. I know it's anti what you might have heard before, anti what they tell you to do. But that's how you, that's how you make the Lord your source of joy is by getting lost in love. He said, let your moderation be known unto me. Love, joy is an antidepressant. He said, why? The Lord is at hand. What does the Lord at hand represent? The presence of God. The help of God, the might of God, the fight of God, the pleasures of God, the prosperity of God, the blessing of God, the anointing of God. That's what the Lord is at hand me. That was, a, that was a term that was used as a military phrase that's used to say, hey, your help is here. The, the Lord is at hand. Your help is right here waiting for you. Don't worry anymore. Then he said this, look, be careful for nothing. But in everything, through prayer. Now, well, we got to go back. Be careful for nothing. So, so, so again, Paul, Paul is positioning them for Philippians 4.19. He's positioning them. Because you can't, you, you can't be anxious, careful for anything and expect to receive from the Lord. Okay? So, 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 let's deal with that word careful. That idea of the word careful right there means, listen, it means to be overly anxious, to be, to be nervous, to be the, to the point to where you're jittery, you're unsure, you, you, you're not, you don't know what's going to happen. It's as if you haven't seen anything already. See, to be nervous and anxious and worrisome, and that's, that's an anti-faith expression. It means, it means, it means to, be, to have anxiety attacks, panic attacks. Well, you start, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? I don't know. Hey, hey, pray God. No, no, calm. Calm down. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I glorify you for the solution. Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you for the joy. I thank you that you're my strength. Lord, I just, just start praising him. Enter into the joy of the Lord. We enter, his, we enter his, 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 his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. So you just start praying. That's how you calm down. Because being overly anxious, nervous, worrisome, having anxiety and panic attacks, guess what that does? Leaves the hypertension. Y'all know what hypertension is? Hypertension, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, Kidney disease, eye problems, barrenness. That's all hypertension. When I say, when I say, when I say, everything is built in. Your health is built in to your faith life. Overcoming heart disease and panic and anxiety is built into the faith life. Everything is built in. Just like when God created the earth, 
He put everything in the earth man would ever need to have dominion in the earth. He put it in the earth. Man didn't have to ask him for nothing. Salvation is the same way. We don't have to ask God for anything. It's all built into our salvation, which is manifested through our faith life. What we got to come into is a knowledge and an understanding of how to leverage those things that are built in. Same way we have done in the earth. We have to know how to leverage the, the resources that's in the earth to create an economy that enables us to experience the manifestation of the goodness of God in our life. Same thing. When he said, when he said be careful for nothing, he's saying, listen, lay aside anxiety. Lay aside panic attacks, lay aside hypertension, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, eye problems, barrenness, lay it all aside. Folk can't have babies because they worry about they can't have babies. Just rest in the fact that the Lord heals me and my childbearing and do what you got to do to get pregnant. That's it. And I'm not talking about once a month, timing, I'm talking about flooding that thing. Like if you got to do it every day. For the next three months, then y'all, you and the husband, get in there and make it happen every day. Like, if you really want to get pregnant, tickle me, man, tickle me. Folks, I like, ain't got folks talking about they trying to get pregnant. I said, trying? What What you mean trying? Oh, well, we time it to, we know the day that I'm ovulated, and so we wait to that day. Well, y'all wait to that day. What? Man, you, man, man, bro, you better flood the womb, man. Bible come in like a flood. Bible said, he come in, he come in like a flood. No, so anyway, when Paul says be careful, like, like he's preparing them for Philippians. You, you can't be careful for nothing and walk in Philippians 4.19. You, you ain't going to be able to do it. He says, but in everything, by prayer. Now, this is an interesting word for prayer. Very interesting, right? It's, it's, it speaks to the basics of fellowship. We're talking about the basics of fellowship. I'm talking about the foundation. Look, reading your Bible. Reading your Bible. That's, that's one of the things it speaks to. The basis of fellowship, right? Reading your Bible, meditation, meditating, thinking on the word. I'm talking about stuff you could do driving the car, laying in the bed, sitting on the toilet, talking on the phone, like, like dialoguing with Holy Spirit. Ah, oh, basics of sitting there talking about sitting there, sitting there thinking about Holy Ghost, thinking about the word you read this morning, the words you heard last night. Think about reading the Bible. Read just, I read myself to sleep. I read myself away. This word prayer is talking about the basics of fellowship. Supplication. What well, supplication is associated with, with well, it's connected to your needs being supplied. The actual word is petition, which is a legal term. Well, now, because of, his how it works, because of what God has shown you. God has shown me, call Sister Leslie, tell you love, tell you going to meet me, to marry Sister Leslie, right? Now, God is responsible, and I can go to God based off of the legalities of our relationship to supply my every need to be a husband. Everything I need to be a husband, it's, it's his responsibility to supply. If, if I don't perceive it, then I, have, I can petition him. I can legally say, Lord, you told me to marry her. You told me to be a husband to her. Now I need you to supply everything I need in order for me to be the husband to her she's supposed to, I'm supposed to be. That's petitioning. When you, when you go to God on the basis of him giving you instruction, him leading you to do a particular thing, and now you say, I, in order for this to happen, this is what I need. So he says, by, he says, in order for you not to be careful for anything, by, but in everything, in everything that God has called me to do, by the basics of fellowship, reading, meditating, and, and communing with the Holy Spirit, which will lead to a supplication and you petitioning him with a language of gratefulness. The verse says, with thanksgiving. And again, this language is built into you believing. When you, when you, when you believe God, because of what he's revealed to you, what, but because of the faith he's given you, your language will change. How you communicate to God will change. Instead of begging, you'll start thanking. Instead of crying, you'll start praising. Instead of moaning and complaining, you'll start, you'll start exalting and, invener and, and, and venerating. You'll start lauding and applauding. Instead of moping and moaning. 
He said, use a language of gratefulness. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for doing this. Lord, I thank you for, for manifest. Lord, I thank you for the manifest. Lord, I just, I'm just, Lord, I just thank you. You can, you can hear when someone's grateful for something, when they appreciate you. It's built into the language of faith. He said, let your request or the things required be made known unto God. And what will happen? The peace of God, the tranquility of God. The actual thought in that is, is when you realize that you've been exempt or exempted from the rage and havoc and evil of life. He says, he says he's delivered you from the present evils of this world. When you realize you've been delivered from the present evils of this world, you, you walk in a peace and tranquility that just because it happened to them don't mean it's going to happen to me. Well, we can go at any time. No, no, not, not the believer. Well, anything can happen to you at any moment. No, 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 not to the believer. Well, this thing can just happen on anybody just being, no, 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 not to the child of God. Because I live from I live in this tranquility from because I'm exempt from the rage and the evils of this present world. I live in the sense of a security and protection and safety. That's what that word peace represents. I live from this tranquility. That, listen, I'm going to be secured. I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be protected. I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to be made whole. That's my salvation. And the, and the tranquility, the, 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 the security, the safety, the peace of God which passes all understanding. And that's speaking to the natural understanding. That's speaking to the unrenewed mind. It shall keep my, my state, my emotional state. This word heart is in reference to the emotional state. My heart, my emotional state, which we all know that more than anything, if you are emotionally unstable, that'll cause you to be double-minded. And we know what a double-minded man receives from God. What, what, how much does a double-minded man receive from God? Nothing. Don't receive a thing from God. Ain't no way he can. Because he's of two different minds. One minute he is, one minute he ain't. You can't possess nothing with that kind of mentality. You got to be what the Bible calls single-minded. Which means I got to focus. I got a determination. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to possess this particular thing. We are well able. But my boy, um, man, I can't think of his name. Uh... The only one who believed out of the two that believe out of spies, um, was it, was it, was it, was it, ah. he said, well, I'm, he said, I'm well able even now to go and possess what it is God has for me. Man, I can't think of his name. Um, they're going to bother me. Right. So he said, he said, your heart, your emotional state and your mind through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. So Paul, between verses 4 and verses 7, he laid this foundation for them to be able to receive Philippians 419. Then we get to verse 8. He says, finally, brother. He says, finally. Man, I've been waiting to get to this part the whole time. He says, finally. Whatsoever things are true, and I'm not going to go through all of these things. I'm just going to read them. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, he says, think. Now, the one thing I am going to talk about is for that word think, it says think on these things, right? So, so, so now what you got to hear inside of this is you are in control of what you think. Hear that. Hear the implication of that. You are in control of what you think. Say, I am in control of what I think. Jesus said it like this. He said, take no thought saying. Just because a thought comes to your mind don't mean it's your thought. The Bible says the thoughts of the righteous are only right. So if there's a thought that comes to my mind that's not in line with the righteousness of God, that's not my thought. I don't claim it by speaking it or by, or by saying it silently or by hearing it. The whole idea of saying it is hearing it. I don't take thought that's not in, that's not in accordance to righteousness. I don't take it. I don't possess it. I don't say it. I don't speak it. I think on the things that are true, I will think on the things that are honest, I will think on the things that are, that are pure, I will think on the things that are lovely, I will think on things that are of a good report, I will think on things that are virtuous, I will think on things that are worthy of praise, I will think on these things. Say that to yourself, I will think on these things. You want to talk about mental health? You want to talk about living in a state of mental health? When you, when you listen, when you think on things that are true, when you think on things that are honest, when you think on things that are just, when you think on things that are pure, when you think that the things are lovely, when you think on things that are of a good report, when you think on things that are virtuous, you want to think on things that are praiseworthy, you're going, to, you're going to be in a state of mental health like you've never known before. This is true mental health. 
If I had to boil mental health down to one thing, it's you being in control of your thoughts. That's what mental health comes down to. You being in control. And God has given us a an ability to control what we think. Stop hearing that stuff. Stop saying that stuff. And feel your mind. With Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, those things which you have both. Now, this is important. Those things which you have both learned. See what he mentioned first. Learned. Say, I am a learner. If you call yourself a disciple, that's what you're saying. I'm a lifetime learner. I long to learn. I love to learn. Say, say I long to learn. I love to learn. S especially about my Lord Jesus, about my Father God, and about the things the Holy Spirit wants me to learn. He says those things which you have both learned, that word learning means to have a full understanding. Like it ain't enough to just hear something. It ain't enough to just read something. Like you got to have a complete comprehensive understanding of how that thing operates. Those things which you have understood, received to take hold of. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like when you plant a when you plant a when you plant a seed into the ground, the earth takes hold of it. There's some action associated with it. It begins to wrap the it begins to wrap itself around the earth. Begins to wrap the dirt, the moisture, the minerals. It begins to wrap itself around the seed. The moisture it begins to wrap itself around that seed to soften the seed to open it open up the seed to germinate the seed. The moisture is it's the same way when the, when when you when the word of God when truth is implanted into your spirit you need you need to wrap your your mind your emotion your desire your thought around that word so that word can take root in your spirit take root in your soul and then begin to bring salvation to your soul change the way you think renew your mind stabilize your emotion augment your desire. That's how it works, right? He says, those that take hold of, he says, and heard. Now, the idea of being heard is to be open to. Uh, listen, one of the greatest expressions of, of hearing, of hearing, is when a woman opens herself up for a husband to plant a seed inside of him, to come inside of him. Like, to be, like that's, op that's what it means to open up, the intimacy of that. One of the revelations the Lord gave me as it pertains to hearing it means to give oneself over to. There's no greater, no greater expression of that than the sexual union. But then also there's, a, there's something that rivals it. And I learned this, and the Lord took me back to this, my very first game as a professional athlete. I'll never forget, we was at Joe Robbie State. No, no, we was at, we was at, uh, yeah, we was at Joe Robbie Stadium. And this is just a preseason game. No, 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 it was a regular season game. And, uh, and uh, we were driving down the score. And we were in, um, inside our opponent's 10-yard line. And the crowd was going crazy. It was the game winning drive, actually. The crowd was going crazy. I'm talking about they were going crazy. And um, at the time, we, wasn't, we weren't signaling the plays in. We was running plays in from the sideline. And so Dan could barely hear. He, he, he was, you know, and he started doing like this. Right? He could barely hear, right? And, and when, when Dan started doing that, you, the stadium started to get quiet. I'm talking about 80,000, 60,000 people in the stands going wild, drunk, going nuts. Dan didn't turn it in like this. That means sit down, be quiet. The whole stadium sat down and was quiet. Why? Because they give themselves over to the fans. The fans give themselves over to the players to follow their lead in every situation and every circumstance on that field. I'm them. I went silent. Ran the play. We scored a touchdown. They went crazy. They erupted. Now we're on defense. We kick the ball off. We run down. We 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 get them inside there. They on they hit the end zone. They get the ball on the twenty yard line. We're at the closed end of the stadium. Guess what the defense and all the players on the sideline start doing? We start saying, "Get up, get up, get up, get up." Guess what the whole stadium did? Everybody stood to their feet, and they started screaming at the time. Why? Because they gave themselves over as an audience. That's what the word hearing means. Question. Have you given yourself over to that degree? To your pastor, to your leader, to your teacher, to the one that God has put in your life as a resource to teach you and raise you up and strengthen your faith? Are you, are you, are you, are you, are you hungry for what they have to say to you? What they have to reveal to you? 
Or are you just kind of moping to the game? Or are you just moping to the service? Are you just kind of, I'm going because I got to go. No, like, like on our way to the stadium, we have to take a police escort. Because because they 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 start banging on the bus, they start rocking, they start putting, cause they they just they just want to get at us. They're anxious for us to get off that bus and go get on that field. Like man, you just playing. We got we got listen. We have to elevate our level of intensity as it becomes to to the kingdom of God. He says, "Those things that you've seen in me, do them, execute, and God of peace." shall be with you in your experience, is what he's talking about now. He's with you in the spirit, but he shall be with you in your experience. He says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now your care for me has flourished again, when you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. I'm going to stop right there because I don't want to get into the next verses because these next, these next verses now will get you, will lead us up to Lead us up to because these verses are important. If there's if there's a prerequisite, a precursor to the verse four nineteen, it's these next few verses. I'm gonna save these for Sunday because I want to take my time with this because a lot of us we aren't experiencing Philippians four nineteen because we're not living from Philippians nine through eighteen. When you hear, when you hear the connection, the hunger. The obedience, the love that was expressed by the church of Philippi, you'll see why they were able to easily activate Philippians 4.19. I want that for you. I want that for your life. But you got to want it. You have to be willing to make this, this connection with God through Holy Spirit. You have to be willing to make this connection with the resources that God put in your life and partner with those resources, i.e. Demaris Johnson Ministries, the Worship Center, Faith Life Sessions. You have to be willing to partner and grow together to see the kingdom of God advanced in your life, in your sphere of influence, and in my life, in my ministry sphere of influence. Like partnership is what it's about. Listen, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us tonight. Thank you for your hearing. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your receiving. Thank you for your giving yourself to receive with meekness this engrafted word so that your life and those around you can be saved. Remember, you're beloved, you're blessed, you're destined to prosper, and you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Lord, confirm the word in their life. Make them to know that what they just heard tonight, they need to continue to hear in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.